Greetings, all. This is episode 31 of Hear Her Sports. I'm your host and producer, Elizabeth Emery. Today's guest, Katie Jackson, and I met completely by chance at Havana, a Cuban restaurant in West Palm, Florida. She was there competing, and I said hello because she was wearing her Team USA jacket. I'm so glad I did. Katie is an amazing, warm, dynamic person. We talk about her determination very early on in her diagnosis to compete in the Olympics, balancing training and other parts of her life, and lots of details about riding as an above-knee amputee. Katie is a para-equestrian dressage grade 5 competitor. She began competing at the highest level only a year ago in January 2017. In each of the four international events held last year in the U.S., she finished in the top position for her grade. She also earned four gold medals, representing Team USA in the Nations Cup portion of these same competitions. With her horse, the photogenic Royal Dancer, she is number three on the International Equitation Federation World Ranking List for grade five para-equestrians. Outside the barn, she gives back to her amputee and cancer-fighting communities and co-founded the Austin Sarcoma Support Group. Mostly, though, Katie is laser-focused on representing the U.S. and meddling at the Paralympics in Tokyo. Just a small note in the episode, I read a quote without a source. It's from a post on Equine Exchange. Find a link to that on episode notes at hearhersports.com. Also find there links to Havana, the restaurant, along with other things we discuss. Well, let's get started. She and I start our conversation with a bit of reminiscing. That was so fun, actually. It's I forget sometimes, especially when I've gone straight from a horse show out into, um, you know, to get to the restaurant or something when I have some of my USA gear on, too, that I will get stopped from time to time and people ask me what I'm doing and, and that. So not at all. That was so fun. And I love how sometimes paths connect in the funniest places that I know uh, I know it's that great. place Havana is so good I love that restaurant yeah <laughs> it's probably a good thing I don't live in Florida because I would eat there way too much <laughs> <laughs> so you've been there before I have yeah so this is this was the first time that I'd gotten to stay in Florida for an extended period of time, but um, I had traveled there twice last year for horse shows, so once in January and once in March, and we are there usually um, a little over a week for those, and then the first time was two years ago when I kind of came out on a fact-finding mission to learn more about um, paraquestrian dressage and just see what the sport was all about, so... Um, it's been, yeah, a quick whirlwind to think that that was literally two years ago. And, and now here I am, you know, kind of looking towards the World Equestrian Games and, and towards Tokyo and 2020. So it's been quite an adventure. Yeah, I wanted to start with that question because I kept on having to reread your bio that only two years ago uh, you had your surgery and found I out did. about having cancer. Can you oh, sort of talk uh, about the timeline and and what seems like a very speedy recovery and rise to the top of your sport. Yeah, yeah. So I probably had started having symptoms about a year, year and a half before we found out what was going on. Just some um, pain behind my knee. I actually lost a lot of the flexibility um, in my right knee, but I'd been a runner, nothing crazy like marathons, but I would, you know, run a few miles up to maybe 5'10 just for, for exercise. And as it started going on, it was just explained to me that I was getting a little older and, you know, it was probably a cyst back there and, um, to give it some rest. And as rest turned into, um, more and more months and me starting to limp, I decided it was probably time for a second opinion. Um, and that second opinion was June 30th of 2015. Um, I went actually that same day for an MRI that kind of was inconclusive as far as what it was. We knew it was an assist at that point. Uh, so I made an appointment with, um, we have a surgical oncologist who's thankfully a sarcoma specialist right here in Austin. Uh, and kind of those appointments turned into July 15th, getting my diagnosis of uh, what's called a clear cell sarcoma. It's in the same family as the more commonly known bone cancer called osteosarcoma. Uh, but this one is actually of the soft tissues uh, that was growing behind my right knee. And then on August 5th of 2015 was when I had my surgery, uh, which was an amputation of the right leg above my knee. 
Wow, that's, that's a lot of stuff happening really quickly. It was, it was a whirlwind. It was definitely, you know, those moments that you don't feel like you'll ever, you hear about other people having to go through things like that, but to actually um, live them is, it's, it's incredible. I don't wish it upon anyone, but at the same time, um, I've been really fortunate in that some really amazing things have come from it as well, and one of them being my riding. I grew up as a kiddo with horses and ponies and and actually doing some dressage. Uh, So horses have kind of always been a part of my life, but never to the level that they are now. So I knew I wanted to get back on. I knew that there was something called paraquestrian dressage. Uh, I knew that it was actually a Paralympic sport, but I really didn't know much other than that. And for some reason, as I was going through all of this, that's what my mind just kind of clung on to as a coping mechanism of, okay, I'm going to ride again. And if I have to lose my leg and, and deal with all of this cancer stuff, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to see what I can do with my, my riding career and make, maybe make a bid for the Olympics. So uh, yeah, that was a, a simple statement to say back then. And, and here I am now learning so much more about it. So that was um, gosh, that was January of 2016 that I went out and watched one of the uh, three-star competitions in Florida and got to meet some of the riders that were currently on the team and, and some of the coaches. And they encouraged me to come back two weeks later to do what's called a classification. So in order to ride as a paraequestrian, you have to be evaluated to to see which of the five grades that your disability will fit into. So I did that two weeks later and gosh, from there started, um, started back riding and actually competing in, in 2016 on the national level and then made my international debut a year ago in January down here, um, in Florida. Wow, just a year ago. How about that? Yeah, yeah. So I've been back riding for for two years and, yeah, riding at the three-star level now for a year. So it's it's pretty incredible. Yeah. So, I mean, what gave you the idea that you wanted to, you know, bid for the Olympics? And, I mean, what was the motivation or the interest or determination? I mean, I don't even know what the word would be for what it was that gave you that impetus to dive so deeply into this new sport. I, you know, I think at that point, your life is, is literally kind of every, the path that you were on just got, you know, the box got turned upside down and shook around and, um, you're just, you're kind of trying to grasp for something that, you know, was, is a part of your life that is, is a known. And I, I honestly, I, I don't know exactly where it came from. I mean, we were we were really struggling as we knew it was some type of tumor, but didn't have the diagnosis of of what kind yet. You know, I'm I'm a planner and and I work off of, you know, okay, here's the best case scenario, and I ask, what's the worst case scenario? And he said, you know, it would be amputation of the leg, it would be um, full blown chemo, and you know, kind of just battling, battling for your life at that point. And, and at the same time, you know, in getting the diagnosis, I did, you know, he did say essentially it was your leg or your life. And, and it makes it a little bit easier to have to <laughs> swallow something like that, that, you know, okay. And in, in that perspective, I'm, I'm pretty glad that I, it is something that we can get rid of and it's in a spot that could be, um, you know, that we could actually remove it. And, and then from there, yeah, I don't know. I mean, I've always, the horses have been my happy place. They're the place, you know, they're where I go after work to decompress and to, you know, get back into a good, a good spot. And, and they've always just kind of been therapy for me. So I guess, you know, something in my mind knew that's, that's what I needed at that point and, and said, okay, well, you know, we're going to make horses an even bigger part of your life. <laughs> and did your friends and family just look at you like, oh, brother? 
<laughs> yeah, I, you know, I think we were all just processing and there were such big things going on that I'm sure I'm sure there's plenty of things that I said at that point that I have no recollection of now. But but that's the one that stuck. And um, I actually owned two horses at that time, one that was a retiree and, and one that was quite young. And so, you know, I was back out at the barn visiting them and feeding them carrots just a couple weeks after surgery and you know, itching to get back on. So I think that's the part that stuck, that that was, you know, my motivation to get clearance to go to the barn and my motivation to do my rehab so that I'd get cleared to sit on the horses. And all of that just kind of kept me trucking through. Yeah. I hadn't realized that you had had two horses at the time. So how involved were you in riding prior to finding out about cancer? So horses were more of a hobby. You know, I'd put kind of family and, and career first. Uh, I did ride dressage as as a kiddo, and then I came back as an adult amateur uh, and had competed through uh, the national level, third level with him, um, but more a show here and there as I could fit it in. You know, I did usually after work go out to the barn and, and ride. I actually had been out of the show ring for about five years at the time of my diagnosis just because my, my now retiree had had quite a few injuries that we had um, tried to overcome and, and rehab, and then he would get hurt again. And so I did have a bit of experience um, with riding and dressage, which I think helped me with getting back to the sport and also helped me get back into the show arena at the level that I compete at a little bit easier because I had ridden those movements before. I knew what they should feel like. Um, I never imagined getting to ride the quality of horses that I'm riding now and, and at this level of competition. But I did, you know, I had that background. And so I think that has helped me. You touched on a topic that I find very interesting because I do ride, but I've never had my own horse. Oh, and wow. I've certainly never ridden a super high quality horse. And I was riding and I thought, you know, like, what would it be like to ride a really fancy pants horse? <laughs> <laughs> So how does it differ from sort of just your average horse? Oh my gosh, they're they're amazing. I mean, something that I've gotten to experience, I and mean, I've always had a connection with the horse. And when you're riding them, you know, one of the things I love most about dressage is just you're in this constant communication with them. And and you know, they don't use words, but they're giving you feedback. And you're, you know, with your balance and with your seat, you're telling them where you want to go. And I've I've always thought that that was just pretty amazing that they can be, you know, they literally, sometimes I feel like they're reading your mind. Uh, just that, that connection increases so much. And, uh, these horses, they, they truly love what they do and they are try trying every second, every minute they're just, they're connected with you and they want to do good. They want to, to work for you. And so I've, you know, that part of it has been pretty incredible to see, uh, you know, on the other side, just their the athleticism and and the power. I mean, you are covering so much ground in you know in the canter and in an extended canter, and it's it's just amazing to feel that much power that's contained underneath you and and literally is just waiting for you to tell them. You know, I can I can have him slow down by literally just taking a breath in. And exhaling, and wow, that tells yeah. him to slow down. Or if I open my hand just a little bit with the rein, that tells him to go faster. It's just, it's pretty incredible. But it's, I think it's the power that impresses me the most. That they're just so strong. Wow, that's fun. Are, <laughs> are they are they smarter than the average horse, or is it more training? Do you think? Uh, it's probably a little bit of both. I've had some pretty darn smart horses in the past and, and <laughs> mischievous. I mean, they could figure out how to open their gates and come out and I've taught them tricks and, and that, but, um, I don't know. I mean, I, they definitely have to have a, a pretty high IQ or horse, horse IQ to, to learn some of the things that we teach them and, and to have that understanding. They're, they're pretty incredible animals, really. Well, well I'll have to agree with you on that. So explain some of the details about riding as an amputee. And for example, I see you have a special saddle. I do. I've, I've done some modifications. It's actually a 
regular dressage saddle that what I ride with is a Velcro release strap across my hip on the right side. Um, I call it my, my seat belt cause it <laughs> is kind of that. And that, you know, for the most part, it's pretty passive on that side. Um, if the horse were to stumble or to spook, it just gives me a little bit of an opportunity to have something to catch myself on that side with so that I don't just end up being launched through the air. Um, and it does help too. One of the biggest differences is the weight, you know, on the left side, I have everything from my, you know, lower thigh, my knee, all of that, which is, uh, almost 10 pounds that was, was taken away. And so the right side just kind of floats up. So balance has been the biggest change for me and, and just the biggest thing that I still work with and, and being even in my balance, uh, that strap does kind of help me just get a little bit of security on that side. Cause it literally just kind of wants to float up, especially in the bigger, bigger trot movements. And, and that, um, something that we have actually worked on as well is a posterior thigh block. So something that goes behind the the stump or the re residual limb on the right side, just to give it a little more stability. When I first started riding that area, you get a lot of atrophy and you've really just kind of babied it to make sure that the incision is healing. And as all the nerves are reconnecting in that, it's, it's pretty um, sensitive. So it doesn't do a whole lot in the first few months. So literally when I first got on and would try and canter, it would just roll back and forth uncontrollably, <laughs> kind of do its own little dance on that side. So it's gotten much stronger and I, I actually influence the horse with it. Now I can squeeze uh, the, the adductor muscles on, on that side. And so if I need to, you know, I can kind of tap, tap or, or squeeze to get some of the, the sideways movements with, with the stump, which is pretty incredible. But balance is definitely the thing that I, I still, you know, work with at, at all times and, and has been, you know, kind of the, the biggest hurdle to overcome as an amputee, I think, rider is, is keeping, your, keeping yourself upright and keeping yourself balanced on the horse. Yeah, let, let's jump right into some of the training that you're doing. I imagine core strength is super important and you mentioned balance. Yeah, um, I worked a lot with a physical therapist through learning to walk again, and then she was actually wonderful as I was starting to ride again, and that we adapted a lot of the physical therapy sessions to um, things that would help me strengthen my body for riding. So you're absolutely right. There's lots, lots and lots of core. Um, yeah, we would, we would get um, on a big barrel. And she would have me do things where I was essentially sitting on a barrel like it was the horse. And, and even at one point, we put one of those um, weight sensor cushions under my seat bones, what you would use for somebody who's sitting in a wheelchair all the time to make sure that they're not going to get pressure, pressure sores. And she would have me do different movements in that and then kind of come back to stable or envision myself in the different movements um, of a dressage pattern, like a shoulder in or a half pass or this and that. And then I'd have the screen giving me feedback on where my weight actually was. Um, so it was really, really helpful. Wow. That's, um, she sounds like a really good PT. She was amazing. It was Carrie Callis at St. David's medical center here in Austin. And she's, she's an incredible lady on so many levels, but yeah, it was fun, fun for her. I think I'm the first equestrian she's worked with. She's worked with lots of amputees, but, um, she was, she was game to, you know, watch videos and see what was going on and see how she could help. So, uh, it was, that was really cool. And, I've actually recently started doing some Pilates work with a, a private instructor, and I feel like that has made a big difference as well in just overall um, core strength, flexibility, and just awareness, too, of, of my body and what I'm doing. So for me, actually, a little more fun way to get that core workout in instead of just sitting there and doing planks and crunches and whatever else it is to get everything <laughs> strong. So, yeah. So, okay. So what about other strength training and maybe aerobic exercise that you're doing? 
You know, the thing that I've found, it's it's hard for me at this point, some of the, the aerobic exercises, um, walking gets my lower back really, really tight. Mm. And then the leg that I'm on, I'm not able to run with it. There are running legs. But what I've found is I do a lot on a rowing machine. And that helps me build strength and work on my cardio at the same time. And that's been a, a huge thing, too, because that is another another element of it. You can be really strong, but if you don't have that endurance from the, you know, from that side of things as well. So I'll usually do strength training and some time on the concept, too, to really kind of help with um, getting my cardio back. Yeah, what are the the key elements for being successful at your sport? You know, like how how important is endurance and how important is strength? You know, it's a it's a balance of both. It's it's a lot like ballet in that you have someone, you know, horse and rider where you have a level of strength that's there, but it also has to have flexibility. There has to be tone without rigidity. And so there's, you know, it, it is important to be strong, but you can't, you know, if you're just focusing on strength, you may lose a lot of flexibility and, and then you're, you know, you're not having the, the movement that you need to move with the horse and, and give the signals. Uh, and at the same time, you know, your heart rate goes up a lot. And when you're riding these big horses and, and in these events, I mean, I'll end up coming out of practicing a test and I'm breathing really <laughs> hard. So, I mean, you, you have to be in decent shape to, to do this and, and compete at this level and just, you know, everything that's involved with, um, you know, I like to, to be involved with as much as I can on, on getting the horse ready to go and, and taking care of him. Uh, at the bigger competitions, I'll have a, a groom, but on a day-to-day -day basis, you know, I, I want to be the one getting him ready or giving him his bath and, and doing all of those things. So um, I, I think the better in shape I am, the better I can, I can perform. And um, as an amputee, something that I didn't realize right away, but I still struggle with is we burn a lot more energy just getting from point A to point B, even if you're not going very quickly. I've heard really? it's about, yeah, it's about as an above, above knee amputee. It's a, I think 150% of the energy consumption, um, just literally to, you know, walk across the room. So, uh, wow. I have, I have to be really careful and there's times I'm like, I don't feel like I've done a lot today, but I'm exhausted. <laughs> and it's because I've been walking all around or loading things and unloading things and that. So it definitely, um, I, I would say I'm still kind of a work in progress of getting to know my new body and, and what it needs. And, and also from, for me, from the cancer side of it too, just, just listening a little more and, and the way that I, would have trained in the past. I just, I'm not able to maintain that. I'll get extremely exhausted and I just don't recover the same way. So, um, it's been a learning process for me. I did, um, CrossFit before and would do a lot of, you know, heavy weights and this and that, and I can still do them, but I find, you know, a week or two weeks into that, that I just have kind of burned out all of my energy reserves instead of building them back up. And so, um, it's been a little bit of a, a trial and error for me to find what I can do to increase my fitness, um, but also keep my energy levels sustained. I would expect that your body is still adjusting. I mean, really, it's only been a short time. So are you yeah. expecting that you're going to you know, see changes for another, I don't know, two, three years? Sort of in your mm -hmm. ability to adjust and, and yeah. your workload. I think I, I would think so too. I mean, I, I have to remind myself of that at times that it really hasn't been that long. Um, you know, probably in the last six to nine months, I have noticed that just overall, um, I am feeling better and I am able to take on more and have longer days and, and do more. So I would, I would think that some of that is going to, um, just continue to improve and, um, you know, the more that I can kind of listen to my body too and be in tune with when it's 
just a time to have a rest day or whether this is a good day to push and and some of that I've I've not always been the best at that I kind of <laughs> burn, burn the candle at both ends and just push forward and if you're a little sleepy that's what they made coffee for so um I'm I like I'm your learning. style <laughs> I'm learning yeah that's you know if there's a minute in the day I will fill it yeah. so um taking care of myself has probably been one of the biggest biggest challenges of this and just kind of learning what I need to do that. But yeah, hopefully, you know, hopefully as I, as I continue and things, you know, this kind of new normal be really establishes, I, I would think that it'll get, I'll get into a little more of a groove. Right. So I want to talk about what you what kind of training you're doing on the horse, but first I want to find out about your horse. Yeah. So my horse's name is Royal Dancer. And he is a 13-year-old Westphalian gelding who has had quite a quite a career so far. He was um, ridden by my coach's daughter for quite some time in what we call able body dressage, and she competed with him and and did quite a bit um, and had some success, even some horse of the years and and some big awards. And then he actually started his paradressage career with another rider at our barn, Roxanne Trunnell, and ended up going to Rio with her as her mount wow. for the Paralympics in 2016. I know. And then I was I was lucky enough to start riding him the following spring after the horse I was riding had sustained an injury. And so I was really lucky to get to get to ride him. And we connected, I felt like really, really quickly, um, had just an instant connection. And so I've been riding him actually since March of last year and then was able to uh, purchase him this fall. So I get to be his mama now, which is really, really exciting. That's so great. he's just... A super, super sweet guy. Uh, he's always, you know, ready to work and, and ready to just try his heart out for you, which is is really amazing. I mean, when I talk about horses that can read your mind, I literally, it's almost spooky sometimes where he'll do things. And I'm like, how did you know that's what I wanted? Because <laughs> I don't think I gave that aid yet, but I guess I did <laughs> shift a little bit. So he's, um, and he's just a goof. He he loves giving kisses. He's always in your pocket trying to find a treat. And I also found out that he's a huge ham, too. He loves attention. Uh, I had the, the prosthetics company, Austin Prosthetic Center here in Austin, came up to the barn uh, to meet him and do a testimonial for my prosthesis there. And I wasn't sure how he'd respond to having cameras around and all the people. <laughs> He loved it. Absolutely loved it. I just couldn't stop laughing at him. He just was being such a goof and just absolutely soaked up all the attention. So <laughs> That's he's, really funny. He's pretty <laughs> funny. So. Um, so I saw a, a quote somewhere. I don't remember where it was, but it's initially the horse can feel confused and frustrated by the asymmetry of her body. So it's important for Katie to find horses with the patience and willingness to figure it out without getting stressed. Mm -hmm. Can you talk about that a little bit and maybe also, you know, what changes have you made in the training and the cues that you give? Yeah, so it, it is really true. And it's it's just like, you know, you'll, you'll kind of get to know a horse's temperament as they're learning from when they're a baby up and, and some horses as you face them with a new challenge or something more demanding, uh, can go into it with like, okay, I don't really understand, but I'm going to work with you. We'll figure this out. And other ones have to go through a little more of a process of what what's going on. And I, you know, aren't, aren't as initially wanting to um, work with you. The biggest thing I think when I first try a horse or when I first get on is what I call is kind of establishing a new neutral. So horses are used to you're sitting on them and you have your, your um, seat bones balanced on either side of the saddle. And then you have your legs just kind of lightly draped on either side. So they're not putting pressure on, but they're touching the horse so that they know that there's uh, a leg there. A, a lot of times you'll hear trainers say it's like a wet towel, just kind of draped in that area. Um, but for me, I have that wet towel draped on the left side and, and nothing on the right. And, you know, the more trained horses 
for them, that would be essentially a, a cue to move sideways or to move over to the right side because they oh, have a, a zero on one side and, and a slight pressure on the on the other. So, you know, for them, it's just kind of evening that out and, and teaching them, okay, this is, this is what you're going to need to feel. And you're going to kind of have to establish that this is, this is our ground zero for just moving in a straight line. And then if I do want you to move sideways or move, you know, your haunches to the inside or that, I'm going to put more pressure on the one side. Uh, and then I also, I'm allowed to carry a whip at, at any time, while riding or in in competition, and and getting the horses just to know that that it's not a punishment. You know, for me, it's just an aid. It's it's the extension of my leg that's not there. So I will use it with just you know just even resting it on their side, and I'll I'll use that at first to just tell them no, go in a straight line, uh, or as I'm starting to get them to learn about moving off, you know, what would be my right leg. Uh, I'll use the whip and again, just kind of a little light tap in the spot where my leg would normally be. And, and for most horses, it's something that, you know, again, they're, they're a little bit confused about. And, and a lot of times I'll start off and I've had some that literally the first time I ride them, I just walk. And that's all we do is kind of work on moving side to side or forward and back and all those things um, without the leg. Occasionally there's a horse that just it's a little too much for them. It's, it is a new language and they want their old language and they're just not sure how to, how to handle that. And, you know, whether it's an experience that they had in the past and maybe they're a horse that, you know, just really is uncomfortable with, with having or carrying a whip or, um, they're just too sensitive. Um, I've had a couple where you could just tell that I'm sure they would have figured it out, but it just stressed them too much, which is just not, you know, it's not the relationship you want and it's not the environment you want for the horse too. You know, you want them happy and, and willing to work. And if it's just not, um, going to be a healthy, happy situation for them, then it, you know, riding with me on is maybe not the best thing for them. For me too, with, with the help of my coach, you know, there were times that if there was something I was really struggling with, he could get on the horse and even though there's a leg there, he wouldn't use it. And so he would essentially use all of the cues that I would be using. Uh, and then to just kind of go through the, the language gap would occasionally, you know, use his leg and say, no, this is, this is what we're wanting. And then reinforce it with, with the whip or with the aids to just help the horse kind of learn that new language a little bit. So it's, it's definitely important to have, you know, good people and good experience around you to, to help with that. And I think every, every rider is a little different in their needs. And so it's kind of, um, a fun challenge as well of thinking outside the box of what can we do to help this horse learn, you know, and learn this new language. Cause for the most part, a lot of our pair of horses have had a career in dressage prior to coming into the paraquestrian world. Right. Some of that, you know, has to do with safety as well, that we want them to have the experience in the show ring and the experience in different environments. You know, we compete in Florida in the big international stadium, and that's a pretty electric environment for a lot of horses. So it's important to have a horse that is able to, to cope with different environments and cope with the, that added stress as well. Hmm. So are all the cues that your leg that's not there would Mm -hmm. be doing is now the whip or are there other alterations that you've made? You know, I find that I actually, I don't, once I've gotten to know the horse and, and for, for instance, for Royal Dancer and I, I don't actually use my whip that much anymore. Hmm. Um, And I am, I'm really influencing him off my seat uh, and off of just the distribution of my weight and my position in the saddle and, you know, enforcing it sometimes if I need a little more expression or if he's, you know, maybe just being a little lazy that day, I'll give him a, a tap. But he's really learned to do the movements and respond to my seat. And even like I was mentioning to the little bit of my my leg that is there, Um so I really, for him and, and for some of the other horses that I've gotten to ride long enough and have that relationship, I really don't use the whip um, as, as anything more than kind of a refining aid mm-hmm. at that point. Almost 
the way they would say you'd use a spur. You know, it's only there if you need a little more expression or if you need just a little bit of, you know, a little bit more for what you're doing. Right. Hmm. Which is pretty neat. Yeah. yeah, that's cool. So what are your weeks like? And what, and that answer, like how often are you getting on, on the horse and training on the horse? That's a great question. And it's been a little different lately over the past two years, I've actually trained out of uh, North Texas Equestrian Center up in Dallas, and I live in Austin. So it's about 200 miles door to door from where I live to where the horse where Royal lives. Uh, so I'm lucky enough to kind of find a balance between between the two parts of my life. I was in my office Monday, Tuesday, and Wednesday mornings, and then I would drive Wednesday afternoon up so that I could ride Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, and occasionally a Saturday, and then I would drive back home. So um, pretty pretty hard in, in a lot of ways to, you know, essentially live in, in two cities, but it gave me, you know, the abilities were pretty, we're pretty uh, rooted here in, in Austin and, and love Austin. And so it just wasn't possible to make, make the move up North. Um, but it was, it was nice to have the level of, of coaching and, and that. So um, I've made it work. It's, it's, I would love to ride a little bit more, but you know, the nice thing when I'm up there, I can focus on riding and, um, I've had the opportunity to ride multiple horses during the day. And so I can really kind of pack in as much as I can into those days. And then when I'm here, I can, you know, focus on my office and my husband and my dogs and, <laughs> um, <laughs> And, and balance the two. So it's, it's not been in a perfect situation, but I've been making it work. Excellent. So, yeah. And you say office, what's, what's your office? Uh, I have a general dental office that I own and own and manage now and, uh, was the sole practitioner for, um, about four years before my diagnosis. So it's been really good. It's kind of the best of both worlds to still get to, you know, have, have a job and, and have something that keeps me um, just as busy as I want it to keep me and to get to do something else too now that I find just amazingly fulfilling and um, rewarding in, in a lot of other ways too. And how much are you traveling for competitions? So the competitions, there's right now there's four international level competitions in the U.S. each year. Uh, and we're usually gone about a little under two weeks for each of those competitions. The horses travel on um, air ride semi vans that are converted so that they uh, have a nice box stall, a nice big area to, to travel in. So the horses will leave usually four or five days before competition so that they have time to rest and recuperate and be, you know, back in their prime before we're competing. For this year, two of the competitions were two weeks apart in Florida. So I actually left December 28th with the horses to, to come to Florida, and I was down there with them until January 28th. It's amazing down there. I mean, there's just the the quality of horses, the quality of riding, just the, the people that are down there. I mean, it literally is um, people from all over the world and some of our top riders, you know, people that are just walking by you getting a cup of coffee and, you know, that's someone that's won a medal in the Olympics. I mean, it's just, it's incredible. And, and I think that it has helped me kind of up my game as well to be um, in that environment and, and just watching and learning as much as I can from everyone down there too. Mm, I bet. Yeah. Do you like competing? I do. I do. I actually, if I'm, if I'm not competing for a while, I start to miss it. So, uh, there's just something about kind of that. There's nothing that really replaces being in the show arena, uh, as far as kind of testing your training and, and getting your performance to the next level. I mean, you're getting feedback from international level judges and, you know, you have six and a half minutes to show show what you've got. So um, it's it's hard. I mean, it can be the the highest high or the lowest low if things don't go so well. But it's it's pretty incredible and and just neat. You know, as that kind of tester to see, okay, we've been working on these things. Can we put it together and and make it count when it when it needs to count? 
And Royal Dancer, does he like competing? He does. He really does. I mean, he kind of lights up. And, and honestly, I think one of his favorite things is is being in there. And, and it goes back to kind of being that ham in the spotlight. I think he right. knows that everybody's <laughs> watching him and he loves it. Yeah. And you're aiming for the 2020 Paralympics in Tokyo. So what are your next two years going to be like? What, what kind of prep are you doing? Uh, so, you know, the biggest thing are, are these competitions and just getting the feedback from, from the judges and then, uh, in the interim working with, um, our coaches to really kind of increase both our strength and the horse's strength and, uh, really iron out some of the small details that are, uh, what can, what can get you to that next level? I mean, the goal is, is not only to, to be in Tokyo at the Paralympics, but also to be bringing home a medal for, for Team USA. So, you know, we're really looking at what is, what is that going to take to get us up on the medal podium and, and, um, have those types of performances. So it's, you know, it's the little details that can count to get, to get that score. So for me, it will probably, be working with, you know, I, I love learning from, from different people. So probably continuing to work, um, with a group of, of coaches and, and getting feedback from, from them as well. I have actually been talking with one of our, our high performance consultant for the U S Michelle Asseline, you know, that we may actually look for a second horse for me as well. So I'm kind of putting, putting that out to the universe and that'll be some kind of exciting things in the next couple of weeks that I'm going to be to be posting to see, you know, we really want to get a, um, you know, a metal caliber horse out there. And, and I think that, you know, Royal Dancer is, is an amazing, amazing partner. And I, I believe that he could be it, but I think it could also be, um, awesome to, to have another horse to, to compete with as well. I would expect it would be nice to have somebody in the wings regardless it is. Yeah. I mean, you learn, you learn something from every horse that you're on. You really do. And so I think for me as a rider, you know, the more experience I can have and, and, you know, having two horses gives me even more experience in the show ring as right. well. You know, it's, it's anything we can do to up our game and, and make ourselves more prepared. This year we're qualifying for the world equestrian games, which are going to be held actually for the only the second time in the U.S. They're in North Carolina at Tryon. From there in 2019, I think as far as preparing, potentially going abroad, I think will be a huge asset just from an experience level, getting the horses in some new environments, you know, really competing against a lot of our other paraquestrian teams from, from the European countries that um, really are you know, at the top of their game and are the ones that are getting the, the gold medals. And, and so learn, learn from them as well, um, hopefully in that year in between. And I know that you're involved in the Austin Amputee Support Group and the Para Equestrian Association Mentor Program and the Austin Sarcoma Support Group. So you're very involved in this new life. I am. I, I am. Um, I've I've thought from the beginning, you know, there's really kind of a bigger purpose to why this happened and, and why I'm going through it. And, you know, I, I don't know exactly what that means still, but, you know, I've definitely found a lot of um, even just good for myself and in, in giving back and, and sharing my story and, and hopefully helping others through my experience, you know, even if it's just to have a little bit of better day or to put something that they're going through in their life into perspective and say, you know what, this isn't that big a deal. Let's just, you know, let's push forward. It will, it will be fine. So, um, a, another woman here in Austin, who's also a, a sarcoma survivor and I started the Austin sarcoma support group and got it kind of off the, off the ground last summer. And so that's been, really rewarding because when she and I went through it, there really, there really wasn't anything in the area. We had a great team of, of doctors and, and support on that side of things, but 
you know, they're busy. They have a lot of, a lot of patients. It's not their job to kind of have that other part of the community. And, and so, you know, there was a, a gentleman who I did get to connect with and he actually came walking into my hospital room, I think maybe just a day after my surgery. And he was up on a prosthesis and, and walking in. And I was like, gosh, if Jeremy can, if Jeremy can do this, you know, I can do this too. And so I know that, that could be a huge help as you're going through things to just know other people or even just have someone ask a question about like, Hey, it's, I'm doing this or that. Is that normal? So that's been really rewarding. Um, I've gotten involved too with the company that manufactures my microprocessor knee called Autobach. Uh, and in an awesome turn of events, they moved their headquarters to Austin a few years back. (laughs) So they're right down the road and just an incredible group of people. And so it's been really fun to get to work with them. I've, I've gotten the opportunity to test drive a few of the up and coming technology as far as knees and a microprocessor ankle that works with my knee to have an even more dynamic movement pattern that's a lot more similar to a, a normal walking gait. So that's, it's been fun and, and connecting with other amputees and you know, hopefully helping them if I can and, and they're there for me as well has been, has been pretty cool. It seems like you, like your whole sort of outlook on life has changed and with amputation and riding and I don't know, it just seems very different from before. Am I reading that correctly? Yeah, I think you're, I think you're spot on. Um, You know, I think that I was very, I had some blinders on and, you know, I was very kind of task oriented and, and driven and, and I had you know, I I had a wonderful life and and things were, I was very blessed, but I think um, I just, this forced me to take those blinders off and absorb, absorb everything and and really stop and and appreciate the small things a little bit more and, and take the time to really appreciate all of those things instead of, okay, you know, this mission's been accomplished. What's the next thing? What's the next thing we've got to do? You know, and, and so, it has given me just a little bit better, better perspective on, on what's important and, and what I want to do and, and giving myself per- permission to do it as well. That's, that's been a, a hard thing with, you know, I, I wasn't maybe the happiest person um, in private practice. And, and as much as I loved my patients and I loved the science and, and helping people, the realities of private practice, are, it's really hard. It's a, a difficult life and giving my all every day le- didn't leave a whole lot of me to give to the rest of my life. And, and, you know, looking back on it, it was, you know, I wouldn't change a thing, but I think that this is such a better balance for me. It's great to find what you're there for or something. I don't, hard to Hard to explain. Yeah, no, it is. It is. It's one of those of like, you know, there was, like I said, I was very blessed, but in this new path, I feel like it's just, I'm, I'm giving more and, and, and receiving more in return, Mm -hmm. I guess. And, and just, you know, experiencing every part of life. Well, we're wrapping up, but I first want to ask you some, uh, some questions about food. Like what's your favorite breakfast or your favorite snack? Oh gosh. So breakfast for me right now is usually, I found this amazing, it's a paleo granola. Um, it's organic that you can find at Whole Foods. And so it has just a little bit of sweetness to it. So I usually use that with a plain, um, like a cashew based or, or some based yogurt um, with some fresh organic berries on it. And I found that that gets me going in the morning and, and keeps me going. Um and as a snack, I love fruit. So it's usually going to be apples with peanut butter or celery with peanut butter. Um, just something to, you know, satisfy that sweet tooth that just doesn't seem to go away, but not, not give in to <laughs> the things that really I shouldn't be eating too. Right. It so. sounds like nutrition and food is important to you. 
It really, you know, that's, that's been something I was, I was on that road to kind of discovering food and and the importance of it before all of this, but, you know, in, in learning more about the connections of some of the, you know, pesticides in relation to cancer and, and just, you know, the food that we eat is our fuel. And so, you know, the cleaner that we can eat and, and things that give us energy are just are so much better. And, and I can tell, I mean, if I cheat and we're going out to eat and I eat a bunch of stuff that tastes really great, but, you know, the next day I will, I'll feel it. I mean, I just feel like I'm driving with the parking brake on for the rest of the day. <laughs> so it's, it's been kind of a, a path for me to find that, you know, even eating organic and and the more that I can eat that my body's not having to try and filter out excess chemicals and that like I can I can notice a difference even there. So tough to do, especially on the road. But I found kind of some staples and things that I can travel with that my body does good on and and gives gives me energy without, you know, too much sugar or other bad stuff. Do you eat meat? I do eat meat. Yes. Mm -hmm. Um, I try to source it again as, as best I can. I try and always just do wild caught fish. And then I usually, it's mainly fish and a little bit of like a grass fed organic beef. I don't do a lot of chicken um, and pork. I'll eat it every once in a while. But for whatever reason, I feel like I, my tummy just doesn't love it as much. Mm-hmm. So those are usually my two kind of sources of meat. And it sounds like you don't eat dairy. I try not to. No, I can get away with, and I love cheese. So I, I reserve my dairy for my my gouda and my hard <laughs> cheddars and and those with a, a glass of wine every once in a while are quite quite nice. But I just I don't eat drink milk. Um, I I've, I've gotten where I really like the organic almond milks and some of the like cashew yogurts and some of those. So I don't do a lot of dairy. Well, Katie, this has been totally an absolute pleasure. I'm so oh. glad that I came up to you at the restaurant. I'll well, say. thank you. I know this is this is just wonderful, and and again, a highlight for me as well. And I do I love when when things like this can work out that it's just a, a coincidence and and coming together. And I I really appreciate the time and and interest in my story as well. Oh, absolutely! It's really it was really a pleasure talking to you. Thanks for listening. If you like this episode, please tell your pals about it. No, really, I mean right now. Send an email to one friend just to say these women are awesome. And also remember to sign up for the newsletter and get the link to a Spotify playlist of favorite workout songs of some of my guests. I'll be back in two weeks with another episode. Bye-bye. Oh gosh, my Roomba just started up. Do you want me to go turn it off real fast? Have you ever wanted to know how to win a Formula One Grand Prix? I mean, really know. Know about the driver tactics from the cockpit, the strategy calls from the pit wall, and even the mind games in the paddock. There's a lot more that goes into winning a Grand Prix than just 90 minutes of racing. So every week on the F1 Strategy Report, we're taking a deep dive into the decisions that shape every result. Hey there, my name is Michael Laminato, and every week I'm joined by an expert guest from the paddock to talk through the big calls that won the race and the missteps that resulted in bitter defeat. Before every race, we'll look back at the previous year's result and consult the current form guide, and we'll be in your feed after every Grand Prix, dissecting the outcome and what it means for the championship. So for your regular hit of Formula One analysis, subscribe to the F1 Strategy Report wherever you get your favourite podcasts. The Strategy Report is a beer mogul podcast on the Evergreen Podcasts Network. My name's Michael Laminato, and I'll catch you after the chequered flag.